There is a fast-growing public awareness of our oceans, ponds, and rivers as a great resource that must be understood and protected in order to be used and enjoyed. Each month brings new evidence of this interest, its nature, and its acceleration. Under such conditions, much is going to be expected of a national aquarium. By the act of authorization, it is committed to a high level of scientific research. Its areas of education and recreation are both linked to the real pleasure that lies in this scientific discipline and the beauty that surrounds it. The advantages in having the National Aquarium in the National Capital are many. We are a traveling nation. We visit the capital and learn more of our country's origins, its history, the richness of its assets, the seriousness of its needs. Students, lawmakers, businessmen, specialists in many fields find in our capital's institutions repositories of information that affect the country as a whole. A 10-mile square formed the original District of Columbia. The mall makes a horizontal line and the vertical extends from the White House to the Jefferson Memorial. On the island that forms East Potomac Park at a point east of the three bridges is the site of the National Aquarium. The site seems to lack a formal relationship to the city. However, considering the location of the new overlook and the proposed bridge as an extension, it would seem that the termination of the bridge might be again extended into a minor mall. This would serve not only the aquarium, but future research facilities and other structures as well. The bridge at the level of the overlook clears river and roadway traffic. The flood conditions recorded over 75 years indicate that the site level be raised six feet to avoid flooding. Here, five different kinds of activities must be housed in approximately 190,000 square feet. Public spaces will take up about 16%, research and administration about 25%. Gallery space that will hold flexible arrangements of tanks and live specimens about 18%. The special exhibition and orientation shows that back up the live exhibits about 16%. A distinctive feature is the living ecologies, where water animals, birds, insects, and plants kept in a near natural balance will be both studied and exhibited, about 25%. This accounts for the enclosed area. But in addition, there is need for an open space, a terrace of a sort, to hold and entertain the large numbers that come on peak fair weather days. It is this open area that will, at the level of the bridge, receive the visitor arriving on foot or minibus. Here admission will be taken, and if a fair day, the visitor may choose to explore the terrace exhibits, or descend by the ramp surrounding the coral reef pool, or by the grand stairway, into a large concourse on the ground floor. Buses of children arrive at the ground level. Luncheon, cloak, and washroom facilities are handy. The information center offers a clear picture of the layout, and through closed-circuit television, programmed inquiry stations, displays, and well-informed personnel, any visitor can choose the tour most appropriate for him on that day. All first-timers will pass through one of the orientation theaters, then exit into a gallery of live specimens that illustrates the central theme. The tanks and partitions and workspace are flexible elements within a fixed 40-foot grid, as are the functions of research. A library, some changing exhibits, and special orientations form the backup that will help give meaning to the live displays. Accessible both from the galleries and from the open terrace will be the ecological greenhouse. When the building is rotated so as to be normal to the plan of the city, the relationship becomes more apparent. These then are the elements that make up the aquarium building. A 400-foot square platform that receives a grid of columns, 
the main floor of the aquarium. This is topped with a terrace, which is linked with the bridge and holds the main entrance lobby. The base for the natural ecologies and the hundred foot high greenhouse that covers it. Seen from the bridge or freeway, the aquarium becomes its own marquee. The open court is an aquatic garden, the terrace an exhibition place. And in the summer, there is a special display where children can touch and poke. The greenhouse dominates the terrace and suggests the excitement within it. The Everglades, that form the largest part of the natural ecologies, would seem to defy enclosure. Yet a close look shows rich and varied aspects that can be enclosed. There are few areas so teeming with aquatic life as the American Everglades. The captured segments such as this can be a fruitful laboratory for the scientist and a rich experience for the visitor. Another part of the greenhouse holds a living piece of intertidal zone from each of the two American coasts, with waves, tides, creatures, plants, and birds. The key to the lessons that lie in these ecologies will be given the visitor in the main orientation theater. A picture of the earth as a great aquatic environment, the variety of forms this environment takes, and something of how it got that way. It will show the pressures of nature that tend to put life in even the most unlikely places, and it will suggest the process of natural selection that produces organisms capable of surviving them. The first gallery of live animals illustrates the point with some extreme cases of adaptation. Eyeless fish from the depths of caves, eggs that dry, then with moisture hatch. Given some notion of the workings of evolution, other oddities in the aquarium may seem less capricious and contribute more to a common understanding of all the other exhibits. There are several minor orientation theaters. One on locomotion, the universal problem of how to get around. It suggests that all the specimens in the aquarium could be studied from this particular point of view. Our perception, the smell, the taste, the senses by which aquatic animals perceive the world around them, the kind of signals they receive, the world as it looks to them, to a pelagic animal or a crustacean. One would also treat animal behavior with exhibits to illustrate territoriality, schooling, courting, and show these traits as a product of natural selection. Symbiosis, the situation in which two entirely different creatures work out a mutually beneficial arrangement. The incredible biological clocks that enable countless members of a particular species spread over large areas to take the same action at the same moment. The mysteries of camouflage and mimicry. A large community pool will illustrate the outer edge of a typical coral reef. Deep enough to show some of the stratification of sea life, it will be a major research and teaching tool. Another natural ecology, trout swimming in the fast-moving water of a 100-foot perimeter, complete with insects, birds, quiet sections for breeding amphibians, a water ousel. Backup exhibits on the insects and the art and the lore. Some animals are seen much as they were millions of years ago. Supporting exhibits will show the clues used in piecing the story together. Fossils for those animals with skeletons. Early soft-bodied ones come down to us through the species that have survived. The algae, earliest of living farms, still a first step in the food chain. There will be special efforts to present the micro-world in a way that becomes meaningful. An exhibition of mollusks, a phylum of 50,000 species. Starfish, coral, aquatic birds, water and wave structure. Phylogenies. The library is a major supporting function of the aquarium. With the classic references, the professional journals, a selection of popular publications, material of historic interest, myth and lore, and some early examples of oceanographic equipment. Exhibitions of new equipment and the story of the work that men are doing with it. One of the last galleries will speak of preservation and restoration of things too late to repair and of things where there is still some time, of new uses of the waters and the sea and of some just being dreamed of. Still, the greatest souvenirs of the aquarium may be the beauty and intellectual stimulation that it holds. 
The principal goal is much the same as that of science, to give the visitor some understanding of the natural world. If the National Aquarium is as good as it can be, it will do just that.